happy Monday, everyone. Doug here, really excited for this week's bonus interview. It is so rad. I had somebody reach out to me uh, and they're like, hey, you want to interview a rock star? And it was pretty awesome. His name's Jeffrey Bryan. He's a musician, a songwriter, composer, plays keyboard, guitar, vocals. And he's currently in the band Survivor, who has hits like Eye of the Tiger, Burning Heart, and the title track from Karate Kid Part 1. And he was actually in the movie. So before we get in that, I got to play the new bonus theme, my buddy TJ. Hit that theme. When you're looking for more and there's no place to go, it's a sequels only bonus show. It's not about sequels this time, you know, it's a sequels only bonus show. Doug and his pals, well, they know what to do. Talking about movies without a part two. Looking for more and there's no place to go, it's a sequels only bonus show. Talking to stars with Doug did sold, it's a sequels only bonus show. Sequels only bonus show. Hey there. So I alluded to it just before. This is the first rock star that I've interviewed. I know Bill Sadler, he plays banjo, and a few of the people I interviewed, they do play instruments. And uh, but man, this guy is a true rock and roller. Grew up in LA, he talked about playing all the amazing places, the Viper Room, Whiskey Go Go, like all those names that you know. And man, dude. So cool that I was able to talk to him. He does a lot of jingles for a lot of TV shows. He composes for movies and uh, TV shows too and series. He does it all and he was really cool. He looked like a rock star and you'll see it. If you're watching on the video, uh, you'll see that, which is pretty rad. So without further ado, here is my first rock star, Jeffrey Bryan. This is awesome, dude. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. That's cool. That's so cool that April reached out. And dude, the, some of the cool stuff that you worked on uh -huh. is pretty rad. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, grew up in the 80s. In LA? And you grew up in LA, right? Oh, yeah. Born and raised. That's so cool. I was just talking to an LA guy. Do you ever see uh, Monster Squad? The mon Monster Squad? No. Yeah. It was like a, it came out in 87. It was about like these four kids going against like, all the old school universal monsters like uh, the Wolfman it, and Dracula. He I think it's like it, it vaguely rings a bell. Yeah. It was like a, like low budget type of. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so I was just talking to him. He was an LA guy and I, you know, it's like a different, I've talked to so many different folks like actors. You're the first, like pretty much full musician. I've well, interviewed actors and stuff that are musicians too. Yeah, I, I looked at your roster and it looks like it's quite a bit of actors. So. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, some people that play instruments like uh, Bill uh, William Sadler, he plays uh -huh. a little bit of banjo. Like that's, oh, that's cool. Thing. Yeah, dude. The so, Steve, uh, this, like the Steve Martin thing. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it all start for you? Like growing up in LA, is it just something you're thrown into? Well, um, I was singing uh, from a pretty young age, I, about, well, 10, 11, 12 years old, I discovered uh, that I had a voice, you know, a big, uh, you know, a big voice in this little, this little package of this <laughs> big voice. And I got a lot of attention from it. So um, it was, let me take one of these off. That's better. Okay. I got these in-ears on. Oh, nice. Sometimes they, they don't always sound great when they're both in there. Uh, anyway, um, so I was, uh, I was singing in LA, just doing, you know, being a kid and learning how to sing and enjoying, uh, you know, my parents' records and, and just kind of discovering music. Um, and that's how it kind of all started for me. I, I, I didn't, I didn't like wake up one day and said, I want to be like, you know, Paul McCartney or yeah. Elton John or something like that. It just, um, sort of, it, it gradually built into a, a life that I grew into, uh, as a really young, you know, just discovering talents that I may have had at that age. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was pretty organic, you know, what were some of the records that you remember? What was like some of the early ones that you sang? Uh, oh my God. Everything from, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, crime of the century, super tramp, nice. uh, the knack. Uh, I mean, it goes all over the place. Uh, hotel California, 
um, Kansas. Uh, I mean, I was singing uh, uh, um, <laughs> Carry On My Wayward Son nice. <laughs> at 11 years old with the guitar, you know, uh, banging that out. Uh, anything that had anything that had a really good vocal, I enjoyed. I mean, that was my thing. Uh, it was just I wanted to sing. I, I, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how uh, that was going to, you know, turn into a uh, music for me. It just, I just knew that this was fun. I liked the attention I was getting. And, um, and then, then, then I realized very, very quickly, uh, pretty young that if I was going to do this, I, I got to stop singing other people's songs or at least, at least learn how to sing some of my own. Cause maybe yeah. I have something I should be doing. So that's when the instruments started to come into play. A, a lot of musicians, it's the other way around. They, they get taught to play piano at like some ridiculous old age, young age, sorry, <laughs> and old age. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's how they start. But for me, it, it was the opposite. It was, I just wanted to be able to accompany myself and write songs. And so I naturally had to learn how to play an instrument in my mind to do that. So that's how that all came about. What was, you know? for, what was the first instrument that you started playing? It was guitar. Actually, that's not true. I, I had drum lessons when I was really young, probably six, <laughs> seven years old. And uh, I was probably too young to have them. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. But yeah, so I was always pretty musical. My, it was, what's interesting is my family's not particularly musical. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they, you know, they, uh, they don't play instruments or it wasn't that I had an older brother or younger brother or whatever that, that I could learn from. Uh, it was just me. I just yeah. discovered something I really, uh, that spoke to me, I guess, you know? And so guitar was my first instrument. And um, it was the obvious choice considering it's lightweight and easy to, relatively easy to bang out a few chords and figure out what I'm doing. But um, I was taking years of, uh, by that time I was junior high and early high school, I was taking years of theory classes and, and counterpoint and all kinds of different uh, classical training musically, but not with an instrument, just music. So I could read and write music. Oh, I just wow. never applied it to an instrument. Wow. So by the time I, I was playing guitar, I knew, I knew what I was playing musically. Um, but for some reason, the, the guitar really didn't, didn't kind of resonate with me. And there was a piano in the house. And that piano was always supposed to be for my sister. Don't touch the piano. She's, that's her thing. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, she's not touching the piano. So uh, I finally gave up about 15 years old. I, I just kept looking at the piano. I had, a, I had a lot of information. I understood music by that time. I mean, I could, you know, look at a piece of music, tell you what's going on with it. I couldn't play it because I didn't know an instrument, you know, I learned it from a singing point of view, but I understood four part harmonies. I understood chorales and, you know, minuets and things like that. Things that a piano player would normally have learned by now. I learned them sort of virtually yeah. uh, without the aid of an instrument. And so I just decided to sit down at the piano and, I, and it was love at first sight. When it finally sat down, I was like, Oh my God, this is what I, this is the missing, the missing link for me. Yeah. You know, this is it. So that's, that's where everything started to explode. It was like, once I finally figured out I could play the piano, I, um, yeah, everything musically just kind of, kind of took me on a, a trajectory that I hadn't been able to understand prior to that, you know, kind of yeah. opened up my world. So at, wasn't it at 15 you played on the Merv Griffin show? Yeah, actually it was a little bit, I think I was 16 or 17 by then. Yeah. Um, yeah, 82. Yeah, I guess I was 16. Yeah. But how does um, that happen from that moment when you first sit down at a piano, yeah. say a year, year and a half, two years later, how does that, that's pretty. It's, it's pretty crazy. I know. <laughs> there, there, there were some events during those early years that when I look back, I mean, I, I don't know how I didn't get whiplash. It was amazing. I mean, that's I just, crazy. holy crap. Um, what happened was I, uh, like I said, I had this passion to sing and get in front of people. And um, it's interesting because at that age, I didn't even know why, you know, yeah. I can, I can totally explain it now. I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. But at that age, I was just, I had this drive. And so I was, um, I played uh, every club you could think of uh, that I, that would let me in. 
you know, my parents would bring me in, have me go on stage and then hustle me out the door because, you know, it's a bar. So um, I would do these open mic nights. And, and I did a couple. I, there, was, there was one called The Hungry Tiger. I don't know. Where are you from, by the way? I'm in Jersey. But, oh, okay. I, but, I, but I interview a lot of people in LA and I work with an actor uh, helping him put his memoirs together. And yeah. a lot of the places you had on there, he like told me he used to do like open mic or go there. And yeah, yeah. Like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a restaurant chain called The Hungry Tiger. <laughs> Uh, I haven't said those words in a long time. <laughs> uh, and, and that was uh, a place where you, you, unlike today, everything's open mic. You got YouTube, yeah. you've got down the street, you got coffee bars. Then it was kind of a new thing where you could get up and just sing. So um, I would go and sign up and have my, my dad bring me or whatever. And I would do my two songs uh, and I'd go home. Uh, there was a, a gentleman there, his, Mark Lemkin was his name. He was the, he ended up being the, I found out, he was the road manager for Seals and Crofts. Oh, wow. And he, he, uh, he produced a, a, a variety show at the Roxy and another one at the Laugh Stop. So two, two clubs. Yeah. And it was a children's show that was every Sunday uh, these these parents could sign their kids up and they they you know they'd file in and have these big birthday parties. I guess the Roxy and needed money. I, I don't know what the deal was, but it, you know what? It was the best thing that ever happened to me because oh, I wow. got this gig. It didn't pay. It wasn't you're going to get paid. You're going to get promotion. And boy, he was right. I mean, you know, I, I didn't care. I was just an opportunity to get up in front of an audience every week. I, I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. And there were a lot of cool, a lot of people that were, uh, a lot of actors, a lot of, a lot of stage moms and their kids. I was one of the older ones and I ended up writing music for some of these kids. And, oh, wow. Um, I mean, I was older. I was what, 17, 16 years old. Yeah. And, and I considered myself to be old. <laughs> so that's, that tells you the kind of how young some of these kids were. Yeah. <laughs> and uh but i it it was an opportunity to perform every week and i guess it got a little bit of notoriety in the local news and um one of the casting agents for uh, a a local well not a local a, a national talk show merv griffin came down to check it out and they wanted to do a segment and uh on the merv griffin show of these kids that are performing like professionals every week at these well known places and um, so I got to, uh, I got picked, you know, to, uh, to, I got asked if I wanted to, to appear on the show to sing a song as <laughs> if I had an album out or something, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I hadn't done anything, um, but I had songs and I, I begged these people, let me do my songs. They wouldn't let me sing my own song. Uh, I, uh, I had to pick a song from a list of pre licensed crap uh, that they insisted uh, but it was cool. I, I managed to find songs I liked, so I, I ended up, you know, picking something decent, I guess. Um, but that was how that happened. It was just performing and being seen, and then asked to. They were. Just, it was, you know, just sort of the sign of the times. It was. Uh, it was kind of a new thing, and it was kind of uh, newsworthy, I guess. And so they did this segment, and it was uh, popular at the time. That's awesome. No, it's so cool. The fact that at that young age, you're on the piano, you're on that. So, so from there, how did, I know you're in LA, so it's pretty much LA, you're, you're going to yeah. act somehow. How did that go from, how did you even get into acting? Did somebody approach well, you or? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it all came from the Merv Griffin. Wow. Because, I mean, you picked the right, uh, there's so many events, so many strange oh, yeah. events in my life. I'm sure a lot of people's lives are like that, but. Um, in my case, that particular event hinged on a lot of doors that sort of swung open wow. unexpectedly. <laughs> I, um, you know, I wasn't really ready to play piano in front of people. I was, I was a singer. I was, I was really strong at, at being a front man and a singer. Um, so it wasn't so much the keyboards was a thing yet. It was just something I was doing. Uh, when I did the Merv Griffin show, I got back to my, uh, the green room and uh, there was a, uh, I remember there was a card and, and some flowers or something, and it was some manager. 
that apparently had managed some of these other kids. I mean, there were there were people in in on this uh, in the show that went on, you know, like a guy named Mark Price who used to be on um, uh, the Michael J. Fox series. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. He was uh, what was his name in the show? He was, was he um, his buddy. Yeah. What, oh, what was, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't, can't remember his name for some. I used to be friends with him years and years ago. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Rist from Brady Bunch was in oh, this. Yeah. You know, there, there were there were there were a ton of like semi kind of known young actors that weren't really known known, but yeah, some of them went on to do some great things. Um, some of them you never heard from them again. And this particular manager guy uh, was kind of involved in that. I guess they saw something marketable with me. I mean, I was. I was what 16 17 years old r- roughly in that neighborhood and and I could still play 12 or 13 you know yeah. I look I look really young I actually had hair so you know <laughs> <laughs> you did so, yeah so yeah I didn't I didn't look like this but uh anyway so I think that's what kind of got them interested the singing obviously they thought I was talented but they, this guy wanted to push me into commercials and 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 things and I'm like why well, that's not what I do and, you know, I got a lot of advice from people that are like, no, this is an opportunity. You take what you can get. You know, it's Hollywood. Just go with it. And I was young and impressionable. And I said, all right, whatever. Uh, I wasn't really that interested in acting. It, it never it never was something that I, I don't I've never really done anything in my life that was something um, if it didn't if it didn't if I wasn't passionate about it or, re- or it resonate with me in some way, I didn't pursue it. it just, yeah. You know, I'm not that kind of a person that would just do something because it had a a dollar sign attached to it or some other uh, more um, superficial reason. And even at 16 years old, I kind of sensed that this felt phony to me, yeah. even though that was kind of immature, maybe a little naive because uh, maybe I closed doors and didn't mean to, you know. Um, so that's how that happened. He, he got me uh, uh, got me an agent. And they were sending me on commercials and I never got a single commercial because I was a horrible actor. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't so much I was a horrible actor. It's just <clears throat> commercials. I wanted to be a rock star. Yeah. And I don't understand how biting into this cheeseburger is going to make me a rock star. You know, that was my attitude at 15 years old, you know? <laughs> so you're like, you're like singing while you're eating the burger and the director's like, kid, just say the line. That's exactly. I went into a couple interviews and I'm looking at these lines and I really, I, I didn't know how to emotionalize. I, is, that, is that a word? Emotionalize? I yeah, didn't know how so. to, I didn't know how to turn them into something. I knew how I could sing it. And a couple times I said, let me just sing this. Cause you know, that's what I felt like I could do well. Yeah. And so I felt like I was being kind of pushed in a direction I wasn't sure was right for me. Uh, who knows? But I pushed my agency, the agency that I was with, which was a commercial agency. They had a small division for a theatrical division. And I begged them to send me out on, you know, like actual parts. And uh, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I had no acting history. I, I had years of a music training by this time, but I didn't know a thing about how to pick up a script and memorize it and, you know, do what actors do. And I felt a little bit like a fish out of water, but they sent me on a couple interviews and I was getting them. (laughs) So, uh, it was a different time period though. You got to remember it was the eighties. And in those days, lot, you know, similar to like horror films kind of were cheap and easy to make, are are cheap and easy to make nowadays. So to speak. Well, the back then it was the coming of age films for, for, you know, like Porky's and Fast Times at Bridgemont High and and uh, Breakfast Club and all that stuff. And and so um, I went out on a t- I went out on all that stuff, by the yeah? way. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I, 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 I would meet a lot of these people that became sort of the Rat Pack people before <laughs> anyone knew who they were. Uh, uh, Ten Soldiers. Well, actually, what's the name of that movie? The Red Dawn. It was called. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was called Ten Soldiers when I. It was. Yeah, that was the that was the working title, and I went out for that, and I, there was everybody. I mean, there was everyone from Swayze to uh, C. Thomas Howell. I mean, they were all there. I don't know oh, yeah. any of them. I, I wasn't a pop culture guy. I didn't follow <laughs> things like that. I, I was a musician. You know, I, 
I, I just felt kind of like, I don't know, in a different space. <laughs> but all those people were there. I did see, I did a scene with C. Thomas Howe. He got it. I didn't. Um, it, it was uh, John Milius, I think, was the director. And, and anyway, it became Red Dawn. But yeah. ton, I have a ton of those stories. I went on on all that stuff. Didn't get most of them, obviously. Uh, but I got a couple, you know, uh, obviously Karate Kid, which yeah. led me there, which was uh, interesting because Karate Kid was not the first movie I was in, um, although it came out before the first movie I was in. So um, it, chronologically, it came later. Um, first movie I was in was called Hot Moves. Yeah, which is like Porky's. Yeah, yeah. It's like like if Porky's had a like like a really shitty brother, <laughs> it, it would be Hot Moves. <laughs> It was, it was, I don't know. I think they made it for 20 cents. It was one of those, I got, Hey, I got to work. Yeah. I, I got in front of a camera. It was, a, I don't never forget those first scenes. It, you know, I just showed up on set and all right, go. You know, there was no director practically. I mean, it was like, I don't know who was making this movie, but, um, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. It was it's scary. It's kind of cool though. that you had that experience that it was kind of like you were doing whatever you want. Because if you had like a, maybe like a, you know, like a Stalin director, it could have been like the worst experience ever. So maybe it was good that they were super yeah. lax. I, I think yes and no. I think I wanted direction. Oh, you know? okay. I, I, I was scared, you know? I mean, oh, I didn't yeah. show it, but I was like, wow, here I am. I have no idea what I'm doing and I have nobody to help me. And it wasn't like I was, you know, crying myself to sleep over it. It just felt awkward, you know. Um, I think if I had a little bit more um, training, I guess, or some preparation, uh, I may have had something to fall back on and felt a little more secure. The, yeah. the truth of the matter was, I'm sorry, the truth of the matter is that uh, it didn't matter. It wasn't like this was Shakespeare. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it just, just go in there and be a kid. That's what you are. And yeah. you, you'll probably be fine. But as a kid who had these visions of being, you know, uh, Dennis DeYoung, young, yeah. you know, or, yeah. or whatever, uh, I, uh, I kept, ha I kept having these confusing, confusing thoughts about, oh, oh, yeah. what am I, what the hell am I doing here? You know? But it 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 uh, it led me to a lot of very cool people, a lot of a lot of cool places, and yeah. Uh, you know, so I certainly, I, I certainly don't regret it. Oh yeah, I think the coolest thing is, and we'll talk about it all. But is the whole Karate Kid connection to like what you're doing now? Yeah, yeah. dude. Yeah, I know. That is no amazing. one would believe that. It's unreal. they don't. They they even are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure they care as much as I do, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I find that really fascinating. I, yeah. I sometimes I, I uh, you know, I just I have to stop and, and think, you know, there's something going on here. What's interesting about Survivor? You're talking about Survivor for the people yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't know. Um, the thing about Survivor, a lot of people don't know this, or maybe some do. Uh, you know, some fans probably definitely know that. You know the fact that they were involved in the Rocky series is not surprising that they were involved in the Karate Kid. Yeah, Rocky 3, there you go. Now, that's Rocky 4. That's Rocky Burning Four, Heart. Yeah, Burning Heart. Burning Heart, yeah. I'm thinking uh, Eye of the Tiger is Rocky 3. Record. That was a steal at a thrift store. Really? Fuck, uh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Is that, is that a shame? I, I walk into these vinyl stores and I'm picking up all these great records for like oh, a dollar, yeah, two dollars. Um. But a lot of people didn't know that the, uh, John Avildsen was the director of Karate Kid. And John Avildsen was also the original director of Rocky One. So oh there, there, there was a connection. Plus, Jerry Weintraub, who yep. produced these movies, produced the Rocky series and produced the Karate Kid series. So he was trying to create a similar, he had so much success with Rocky, he wanted to create it with the Karate Kid and oh, used wow, a lot. Yeah. Bill Conti, who did the, the score, did the score for Karate Kid. Same guy that wrote, you know, gonna fly now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. He wrote all that. Holy so crap. they used a lot. So when, when uh, Survivor had such a big success with Eye of the Tiger, um, they were, and this is why it gets weird, because a lot of people will, will dig this. Uh, <laughs> they were kind of forced to do the moment of truth. They, 
they their record company, Scotty Brothers, I think it was at the time, was um, kind of said, "No, we're gonna get we're gonna get we're gonna get you a Survivor to do the theme song of Karate Kid." And when they when they got to the studio, they said, "Here's the song you'll be doing." Oh. They didn't write that song, and they were like, "What? Are you kidding me?" <laughs> but what's interesting about the moment of truth is that um, if you I don't know how much you know about Survivor, but the first singer. Dave Bickler, who sang Eye of the Tiger, by the time they got to Karate Kid, the moment of truth, Dave was having throat problems uh, and they got a new singer, J- Jimmy Jameson. Oh, and okay. Jimmy is famous for singing, you know, all the big hits off Vital Signs and, and beyond. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, The Search is Over and uh, High on You and Can't Hold Back. That's, that's all Jimmy. So all the oh, okay. big all the big hits that came after the Eye of the Tiger was a different singer, but he his I wouldn't say his audition, but his first throw into uh, Survivor was the moment of truth. Oh my god! They stuck him in there and said, "Well, here, sing this. We didn't write it. We have to do it." Hold, hold on a second. Oh no problem, dude. I just pulled my uh, sorry about that. Pulled my headphones up. Um, so what, what's interesting is that. Uh, hit the first song he sang on uh, that was recorded and released was not a Survivor song. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and little, I'll give you a little side note about that. the The song was written by Bill Conti, who is you know the same guy that wrote all that stuff for uh, Rocky, and um, uh, Peter Beckett from uh, Player. Oh wow! Baby, baby, come back. <laughs> the guy that wrote Baby Come Back. So those two guys must have got together and wrote a song and convinced uh, whoever was in charge of the music supervising to to get Survivor to play their song. So so when I so when I when I when I got in, you know, when I finally started working with Survivor, I said, "Hey, when are we going to do Moment of Truth? What a cool thing!" I was in that movie. They're like, "Don't bring it up again. <laughs> we don't do that song." <laughs> I'm like, "But fans will love it. And we don't care." We don't do it. It's not ours. I'm like, okay. And I think, uh, correct don't me bring wrong, it up again. I think you're in the music video. I am. Yeah, of, of the um, of the trailer. Yeah, I'm in the trailer of the movie. Well, yeah. no, I think you're in the. Music oh, the, video I'm for sorry. The the, of truth. They, they used a piece of the trailer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in their video for Moment yeah. of Truth. That's right. Yeah, and yeah, I'm in it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know. Yeah, but still, it's pretty cool. But, I mean, it's amazing, right? I mean, yeah. third. I didn't know these guys. <laughs> 30 years later, I'm playing keyboards for them. And it's funny, though, because there's been other little near misses I had with them that I didn't know until I look back. Oh, really? When they were recording uh, at Rumbo Recorders, which is in, uh, used to be in uh, Granada Hill. No, no, it's uh, West Hills. And um, there used to be a, a recording studio there called Rumbo. And a lot of people didn't, it wasn't like on the radar for a lot of musicians, just the, just certain ones, because it was way out of the way. It's in the Valley. No one wanted to go to the Valley. So they always had these, you know, I mean, David Bowie recorded there oh, wow. and, um, you know, Tom Petty, everybody did. But the guy that owned the recording studio was Daryl Dragon, Captain of Tennille. Oh, wow. And he owned the recording studio. Uh, and I knew Daryl because of a band I was in with a friend of mine, his name was Patrick Bolin, who used to be in Pure Prairie League, and we had an original band, and he knew Daryl, and Daryl led us into the studio to record our demos for my original band in the 80s, and it was just around the same time that they were recording, uh, uh, I think it was Premonition, one, one of the uh, Survivor records. Yeah, wow. And. Uh, I didn't meet them, but who knows how many times I may have walked through the same door that they did just within days or hours, you know? It was during that time period, because we talked about it, and, and so I kind of put wild, the dates man. together. So there's, there's been a lot of like little weird things that, uh, oh, and the other thing is Daryl Dragon played on the album for Survivor. Oh, really? He played a lot of, a lot of the keyboard parts. So there's, <laughs> there was just the weird connections, you know, that, that uh, you wouldn't think that they would be yeah. until you look back and put them together and get, you know, I, fi- I think I find that more fascinating than they do. Yeah, maybe. 
<laughs> but uh, no, but that's cares? awesome, dude. Yeah. So we'll talk more about the music, but for Karate Kid itself, how long were you on set for that movie? Actually, quite a long time. Really? Uh, almost the whole movie. Yeah. Uh, oh, dude, originally, awesome. originally I went in. It was a two week deal. It was supposed to be a walk in, walk out. You're gonna meet. You're gonna meet the director, John, and uh, and that was it. He, I met him. We did a little video thing. He talked to me on video. I didn't read any lines, and uh, I got a call from my agent. Said you just booked two weeks on this movie that they're doing, Columbia Pictures. I went, oh, okay, great. And before I even got to set, days before that, it was changed. Uh, they extended my con. They extended all of our contracts uh, for. I worked on it from the almost six months. Wow. Yeah, four, four, four to six months. Oh my God. It was it, originally, I, I, you know, there was Frankie Avalon Jr., um, Tom Fridley, who uh, I think his, uh, I think his uncle is uh, uh, John Travolta. Uh, huh. And uh, there was Ken Daly and Israel Warby. Those guys were my friends. Oh, we okay. were like a little pack. Nice. And they had us sort of developing our little thing. And then you had the Cobra Kai guys, you know, Billy Zapka and all there, there you go. Uh, and all the rest of them. And we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, in interact on purpose. Oh, really? That's they they cool. kept a, they kept, uh, they, they kept a very adversarial atmosphere on the set. So coming from hot moves, which I did earlier that summer, which <laughs> no direction to, really being the lowest man on the totem pole. I mean, they could have asked me to sweep the floor and I thought, and I, not with my leg, I mean, literally with a broom. <laughs> and I thought that was probably going to be my job because, you know, there was, I was, I was so low on the totem pole and it was, you know, it was, for me, it was a very big production. It was Columbia Pictures, oh, yeah. Jerry Weintraub. You had all these, um, you know, relatively well-known names, uh, not all of us were well known, but the people they were connected to were all oh, very yeah, connected dude. in the industry. Chad so McQueen. Was, oh, Chad McQueen. That's right. He dude. was. He was there. I know. And and let me tell you, that guy is an animal. He looks I mean, intense in the movie. He's that's him. Yeah. He would throw these parties. Oh my god. Was, I don't know how anyone survived. <laughs> I. I <laughs> yeah. He was. He was crazy. Uh, they were always something going on the the one person that we that we never saw and we all kind of came into came together on this was ralph ah. ralph was ralph was sequestered in a winnebago for the entire time until it was time for him to come out and there was a reason for that i learned later on that john avelson he wanted an atmosphere that he didn't feel safe he wanted it to make it so when he got in front of uh um, you know, B well, Billy, uh, what, Zapka, what yeah, yeah uh, Zapka's character. He didn't, he didn't want to feel like he had a camaraderie with them at all off stage. Oh, wow. And so it was almost, he had a method approach to how he wanted the actors to be. And as, as a young, you know, fairly inexperienced guy and being kind of small, you know, and, and not, not, not knowing any karate or not knowing really anything. <laughs> uh, I was, I felt very threatened on that. I felt like, like it was high school, man. I was like, I'm back in, I'm back in freaking high school. This is <laughs> horrible. Get me off this job. And I, I, <laughs> I kept, I kept bugging my agent. When's this going to end? <laughs> this is horrible. But it wasn't horrible. It was just, that's that, that was, that was the job. You know, it was, a lot of, a lot of, anyway, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm rambling here. Oh no, dude. I love it. No. Cause you know what? I would never have known the, the formula, you know, Hollywood does it all the time, you know? And you know, in the music industry, they do that. There's a formula. Oh my God, this works. So let's yeah. do Rocky. Right. They, a, a 16 year old kid from Jersey. Exactly. And it's crazy the way he sequestered him. So he would feel that way. And the way they split you guys upset. So it's like the animosity can like spill over. Yeah, they wanted That's it awesome. brewing. They wanted it to brew. I remember uh, when we got to um, the final fight scenes, the tournament, yeah. which by, which was was filmed at uh, Cal State Northridge. Oh, um, really? 
it was before in 1994 there was a huge earthquake out here yeah. you probably remember the 94 earthquake the oh, northridge yeah. earthquake it destroyed that building that we were that we filmed in <sighs> it was the auditorium and uh so it's not there anymore but that's where it was filmed and by the time we got to that point in the filming uh um you know the schedule you really thought people were going to break some heads I mean, you know, people were mad at people. It was like there was, you know, it was, it was looking back, it was probably an understandable thing. And, you know, people that were more experienced probably understood what was going on. But I was like, holy shit, I'm talking to these guys. I, I, everyone seemed angry, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that was what, that was part of the, the atmosphere that he wanted to create. And he yeah. did a brilliant job of it. Oh, yeah. You know, um, there, I, I'm telling you, there was fear in Ralph's eyes when uh, that was real. You I know? don't know if they did that for the other movies, but I interviewed uh, the guy. I don't know if you ever saw the third one, but uh, Sean yeah. Kanan, Sean Kanan, who played uh, Mike Barnes, Karate's Bad Boy. Right. And in that movie, that's one thing, because what we do is our formula, for the most part, like I'll interview, like you're so rad. And like if anybody that talks to me isn't in a movie sequel, I still get it out. Like, but my formula is I interview folks that worked on movie sequels yeah. to get like behind the scenes kind of stuff. And then we, me and my buddy review it. Sometimes we have like a guest on. So when we watch that movie, cause you watch a movie different when you're like taking notes and like, yeah, of course. Almost dissecting yeah. it. Yeah. So when we watch the third one and when I talked to Sean, I even said, I'm like this whole movie, you know, Ralph Macho looks like scared. And then the third one, if you remember, yeah, he's, he's, it's really like three adults right. are trying to kick the shit out of a 19-year-old kid. You have Martin Cove, who's I like know. an alcoholic nut job. Yeah. Mike Barnes. And then, dude, I don't know what he was in after it. I don't think he was in much because I tried to interview him. But the guy who played Terry Silver, dude, his character in that movie, if you haven't seen it in a while, it's like so it worth it to go back. He's like this really rich guy with like 10 cars, huge house. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Dude, and he'll do anything yeah. to help out his buddy Martin Cove. Yeah, yeah, they're insane. It's yeah. it's, it's it's an insane character. The, uh, <laughs> but you're right. There was there was a. I mean, I think you'll understand this. There was an innocence to the first Karate Kid. Oh yeah, that, that you're not going to get on those others. They, they. Oh, I know. In in my opinion, I mean, the Cobra Kai, the Cobra Kai series is special for other reasons yeah and it makes sense because it's it's not trying to duplicate karate kid directly yeah. you know it, it's sort of a, a generational kind of view of it whereas the other karate kids they were trying to plug in this same formula into the original film that the original film was successful with and just kind of kind of stamp them you know yeah and and I, I think there was a little bit of uh, authenticity that we lost in two and three, in my opinion. You yeah, know. well, that happens with most. It's really hard. Every sequel that we've covered, it's really hard. It's very rare that the sequel is better than the original. It's like yeah. a very rare occurrence, but uh, it's just cool this, uh, what direction they take sequels. Like we covered D Jaws 2. I directed one of the guys yeah. that helped build the shark. Oh, and like yeah. that movie, the shark becomes like almost I like know. we said he was like Jason Voorhees because in the movie, you see the shark's POV like, uh, like hunting people and it's yeah. like sharks don't do that he didn't right. even the first one but <laughs> yeah i guess they have to you know they they, they get a little carried away sometimes oh but, like yeah you know but <laughs> but what i was saying about the original karate kid is that there was definitely an air of fear yeah. on the set and that was absolutely created by the director that's awesome you know so some of the cool things i saw on your uh, on your little bio on your website, which was so awesome. Thank you. Was the dude the composing? See, like when I interview people, if you didn't have a bio and just say you're like an IMDb or some other website, sometimes people don't have everything. So during the conversation, they'll be like, "Oh, I used to do blank," and it's like, "What?" But the yeah. fact that it's cool that you did all the composing on like like t like those movies like yeah. Carnal Crimes Reunion yeah. and all the game shows and like. So yeah, how did that come about? How'd you get well, approached for that? Well, uh, you're talking about 30 years of writing music. So oh, you did it that long? N no, no, I've been doing oh, okay. it. You know, some of that, some of that work is not that long ago and some of it is a long time ago. Oh, cool. Um, when I was, uh, it, 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 
after Karate Kid, it's I have to go back to the 80s to explain that. Oh, yeah, to explain yeah. the answer. Karate Kid was a very, very difficult movie for me, even though I ended up having almost no lines. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was difficult for that reason. Going to my, I went to my dressing room every day and there were redacted lines. Um, and honestly, they didn't, they just didn't need all of us. They had, you know, four or five of us in, in a camp that they never explored. And, you know, the movie would have been too long and unnecessary. So yeah. I get it. They, they they had to make executive decisions and certain people I was being paid. I was being paid though to wait to see if I was going to work and it created, it was, I know it sounds funny, but it, it that's how the business can oh, be yeah. sometimes you're, you're being, I was uh, kind of basically not able to go on interviews. I mean, even if I did, I would be, uh, wouldn't be able to take the jobs. I yeah. was contracted to Columbia Pictures during that time period. So I was, I was, lo I mean, it wasn't that they weren't paying me well. It was great. It just was not what an 18 year old wanted for him, you know, for myself. I, yeah. I wanted to be, I wanted to be moving forward and I felt like I was not. So Karate Kid was difficult. And when it was over, <clears throat> when I finally got let out of my contract, I, it was a year of acting. I was, I did a, a few other uh, walk-ons on some TV shows um, that aren't in the bio. <laughs> Not that you mentioned that. Um, and uh, I did a few, few things and, and, and it, the whole year was just, uh, you know, really cool. But by the time the Karate Kid ended, it was December, I think of 83. Wow. And um, I, uh, I looked around, I was technically, I was out of work, obviously and um unemployed and i was thinking well now what you know um so i pushed my agent to get me you know, you know whatever i could get and at this point i was thinking pilot season and you know um and uh when i did working with hot moves i had no i i knew all i knew like a lot of people from you know michael j fox and all those guys i used to hang out with those guys because yeah. the the people i worked with on hot moves were were in um high school usa which oh, was nice. one of his first movies and so you know i knew i knew todd bridges i knew all those people just from hanging out i they were in my acting classes and i knew them um so i was i thought okay uh, I'll keep doing this. I'll get a, I'll get a sitcom or I'll get something and I'll be able to pay the bills. That'd be great. <laughs> and then when, and I wasn't getting any work and I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to be broke, I might as well be broke doing what I love to do because I'm not even sure I can do this because yeah. I haven't really gotten a part that can test me yet. You know? So I, I looked around, I said, well, let's see. I, I, when was the last time I performed? When was the last time I put a, a guitar in my hands? And um, I think I was 19, and I said, you know what? I, I got. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start a band and get going. And so I put all my energy into music. And uh, during that time period, I started bands. And I uh, a few years into doing my own bands, I I, uh, I got a publishing deal with A and M. Um, Actually, they were. It was Almo Irving, which was the publishing company for A and M Records, which was later purchased by Rondor. So now it's Rondor. But um, at the time, Polygram purchased uh, their publishing, so I ended up losing the publishing deal. <laughs> but it's that's another story. But um, so I had a publishing deal, and I was a staff writer at A and M for a very short period of time, and um, it taught me that there's ways to make money, you know, other than just getting up on stage. And that's when I started pursuing films and TV work. And um, again, remember we were talking about connections? Yeah. You know, uh, that first connection that got me, uh, the Roxy shows that got me on the Merv Griffin show. Well, that guy, uh, he, who was the um, road manager for Seals and Crofts, he knew a lot of people in the business. So I would talk to him and we did, uh, he was producing something called Swayze dancing, which was uh, back in those days, you, you didn't, you know, you didn't have Netflix, you didn't have streaming, you had the home video market. Yes. Remember that? Uh, yeah, and so you could go it. to like a blockbuster, oh, the best. Uh, or, God, I sound old or, um, you know, or a warehouse records or something and you could rent a video and not all the videos were made by, 
uh, studios. They were individuals or small production companies. Yeah. Anyway, he was producing not Patrick Swayze, <laughs> but <laughs> get this, Patrick Swayze's mom, who taught Patrick Swayze how to dance, what? wanted to capitalize on Swayze, da- on, on Dirty Dancing. Oh my so God, dude. So somehow he convinced her, not uh, this guy, Mark Lemkin, convinced Patrick's mother, <laughs> who was an older lady at this point, she was probably in her 60s, uh, you know, um, t- a really strong Texas straw. I mean, she was the antithesis of, of a seasoned looking type of, someone you'd put in a movie. She was very raw and rough and, and it was a very low budget thing. Anyway, he uh, asked if I wanted to write music to it. So that's how I started that. And, oh my uh, God. What kind so, of music did you write? Like dance kind of too? Yeah. Just, uh, they couldn't, they didn't have a budget to license anything. So they needed some, you know, some schmuck that they could pay almost nothing for that would, you know, knock off some songs you know or make it sound like uh i don't know tiffany or something oh you that's know. what you do you just like at that song time and like well no no the, you would get like uh the way the way a lot of that works is it works the same way now is it's called temp tracks so oh, okay. uh, when they're editing a track they'll put a, a song in that they can't either afford or it's not available to license same thing happened with the eye of the tiger you know with another one bites the dust oh that was, yeah, yeah that was the temp track and they didn't get the licensing for it. Well, that happens all the way down the line. Doesn't matter yeah. the size of the production. And so they had, you know, they would say, "Well, we need a piece that sounds like X, or we needed a piece that sounds like this person." <laughs> and so you would write something inspired by those references, so they would match the edits. That's just typical. That's pretty normal. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's how I got into realizing I could I could do more music. So. Um, that led me to uh, a lot of home video productions because the company that was putting it together, I walked in there and said, Hey, I'm doing the music for your production here. What else you got? You know? And they said, well, we don't have much budget. I said, I- I'm broke. I'll, I'll just give me anything. And so they just laid, they just laid it out. So, well, we got this movie coming up next month. We got this one. I, uh, there was, um, God, if I go back and think it was the time when, you know, the Jane Fonda workout videos were popular. Yeah. Uh, there was, what was his name? Dirk, I want to say Dirk Benedict, or there was an actor that was on the A team, Dirk something. Oh, I, I can't, can't think it was last year. Yeah, but I there, there, about. there were four, four guys of the A team. Yeah. You know, Mr. T and, uh, what's his, uh, um, I'm guessing it'd be face was that guy, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Anyway, he, he had a, a, a workout video. I did the music to that. <laughs> I never met these people. I just was yeah, handed yeah. the video and say, write music. Um, I did a bunch of uh, beauty pageants, you know, that, that Vegas beauty pageants that some companies yeah. were putting, just whatever, you know, whatever. It didn't matter. I was a paycheck and I could, I, you know, it was real music and it, that's all I cared about. So that's, that's what I was doing that concurrently while I was playing in bands in LA. Yeah. So I was doing both. and and. And guess what? It's never stopped. It's, I do the, I'm doing the same thing I did, except with the exception of, you know, traveling with a national act. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a little bit different. But other than that, I'm still, I'm still in bands right now. I'm still uh, performing everywhere I can, and I'm still trying to write music for, for productions. That's it's, awesome, man. My life hasn't changed a lot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the, because you were in a bunch of bands, what were some of the, and you started a lot of the bands, right? Yeah, they were well. They were they were my creations. Yeah, cool. what uh, were I was some the of the singer. What were some of the best names? Uh, I, I wouldn't call them great names. Uh, to you, I had a, they're still with, your babies. Yeah. Well, th- wait. You mean songs or or band? No, 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 like the name of the bands. Oh, the Reach was one of them. That was back when we were influenced by the Fix. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Reach, um, but actually, that was a cool band. Uh, like I said, a, a gentleman named Patrick Bolin, who uh, he, was, uh, he was, these guys were all older than me. I was like 21 and they were in their thirties. So I thought they were like, oh my God, these guys are old, but sh- this will be all right. But they, they had huge resumes. Um, Patrick worked with uh, Kenny Rogers and he was in Pure Prairie League for a while and, uh, you know, did a lot of, you know, a lot of 
uh, national, uh, you know, played guitar for a lot of national guys. And then, um, I can't remember the drummer's name, but he, he toured with the beach boys for some period of time. Oh, wow. So we had some like really talented guys, yeah. uh, in the band and, uh, that band didn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, actually what happened was I was in the band. It was doing fine. We recorded with Daryl Dragon at his studio, all that stuff. And A&M Records saw me at Michelli's. It was my birthday. And I was asked to get up and sing a song. So I got up and I sat down at the piano and I played a ballad. And I went back, to, and yeah, everybody claps, but I, I went back and sat down with my friends back and embarrassingly. And uh, somebody, I swear it's a Hollywood moment. Someone walks up to my table, plops a card down on the table. And I look at it and it says A&M Records. And they said, give us a call. I'm like, okay. I was, really? All right. So um, that's how that happened. And, and I called them and it was a publishing deal. They wanted to offer me a publishing deal. That's how that thing came yeah, about. Yeah. And um, it was because of that publishing deal that the band broke up. They didn't want the band. They wanted the guy that was singing and writing the songs. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, that's just the way, you know, it went. So <clears throat> that kind of, we went our separate ways. Uh, when when Polygram purchased uh, Almore Irving, it, it destroyed my world because everybody on the roster that wasn't a hit songwriter or a hit songwriter yet was being let go. They were just, uh, you know, they were letting everyone loose. They were just cutting, cutting people loose left and right. And I was one of the casualties of that. I didn't have a track record yet. I wasn't there long enough to... to to get that. So, um, I was floundering and, uh, I went on my merry way and decided to put together another band. And, uh, that was the Jeffrey Bryan band. Oh, nice. But what's interesting about the Jeffrey Bryan band was, yes, it was all my own music. I had no other people to compete with, with respect to, uh, like, like, e like, Patrick and I were sort of the two driving forces of the reach, whereas yeah. the Jeffrey Bryan band was all about me. So, you know, in not, it wasn't designed that way. It was just, it, I put it together and the guys I was able to find were more my age and less um, knowledgeable than, than the guys previously. So it was like, Jeff, where are we playing? Where are we doing? So I ended up booking the band. I ended up writing all the songs. I, I did everything. Um, I worked with, uh, I found this guitar player. His name's Doug Rappaport. And uh, Doug, Doug was phenomenal guitar player. And he was about 20. I was about 24, 25. He was probably a few years younger than me. And, he, you know, I considered him a baby. But he was this crazy, amazing uh, guitar player. Uh, and, and he went on to play with, um, um, my mind's going, uh, um, oh, can't even think of his name right now. It'll come to me. Anyway, he went on to play with some really famous uh, guys for like 15 years. Oh, wow. And um, why can't I think of his name? You know him. Uh, uh, um, his brother died recently. He's uh, albino. I can't, I can't remember his name. How funny. Ah, whatever. Anyhow, um, he had a song, Frankenstein. Da -da 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 -da. Why can't I think oh, of Alice his name? Oh, Alice Cooper? No, 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 no. Oh. But someone in that, that someone, um, it doesn't matter. It's not about me anyhow. Yeah. So, but my point is, is I always was able, I always had these really, you know, interesting people that either were around me or I discovered they were interesting after I wasn't around. Yeah, yeah. Um, years later, um, God, it's going to bug me now. <laughs> um, Edgar Winter. Oh, I have oh, no Edgar idea. And, yeah, he's Edgar Winter's guitar player. I mean, he's oh, been, my God. And, he's, and he's, uh, very well known in the in guitar circles as you know a guitar god oh, and um, yeah we were in a I was in a band with him when he was you know just starting out uh, in the Jeffrey Bryan band so I mean I, I had so many bands so it was Jeffrey Bryan band there was live and die which did <laughs> we, we used to play at uh, FM station all the time anyone from LA would would love hearing that I mean FM station yeah that was like a big well, a big bar or club? Well, uh, Filthy McNasty owned it. So that's all you need to know, right? <laughs> the guy's name was Filthy McNasty. Jesus. <laughs> He's famous. 
he, awesome, he owned dude. he owned uh, he owned um, a whole bunch of different properties in L.A. in in the in the heyday in the seventies for him. Um, but FM Station was kind of a rocking place, and it was on Lancashire and in the Valley, and it was a famous. This is famous as the Roxy at one point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we used to play there like all the time. Uh, and uh, Coconut Teaser on Sunset was another one. Um, so I played uh, this another, uh, but a band that I was in for a, quite a long time had, the, in my opinion, the shittiest name of all, Sun Lions, believe it or not. Sounds like a football team. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea how we ended up on that name. But that band was really good. We, uh, we, we put out two records and... Um, we were uh, we came real close to getting some some major things. Uh, had a lot of uh, college radio play. This was in the '90s, so uh, there okay. still was no internet. You know, it wasn't yeah, like yeah. there was nowhere to. You had to literally do a show and sell records and physical records. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it's such a weird world right now compared to what I came from. Oh, I know. But um, yeah, so I, I I had many many bands, and I continued to play in all these bands. And all the while I was developing my chops, you know, playing keys and guitar. But um, keyboards has always been uh, extremely important to my development. And, um, you know, it's sort of my love. It's kind of where, you know, I can sit down at a, a piano and, and just get lost for two hours. That's awesome. So that's, uh, so that brings us to, uh, um, you so asked how me. Did, yeah. Yeah. No, so what I was going to say is, so how'd that come about? So that was 2017, you auditioned for Survivor? Yeah, well, it it was, yeah. I mean, basically, how did, I wish I, yeah, I've got all these cool stories. I could tell you, you know, shit more cool stories, shit loads of them. But this is not a cool story. (laughs) The Survivor thing is just, I have no idea. Um, (laughs) I got an email. That's about as cool as it gets. I got an email. It said, do you want to play for Survivor? And I, I, I looked at the email one day and I said to my wife, someone lying, what, was this a joke? You know, because who, who just writes, would you want to play keyboards for Survivor? But then I looked at the email address and it was from Ir- Irving Azoff's office. Oh, wow. You know, and so I was like, it's got to be something to this. And I looked them up. They had a keyboard player. I actually know them. I knew the guy, you know, I knew oh, wow. he, he's a local keyboard player in LA. And, um, so I was like, what's going on here? So I answered back r- finally. And, uh, it turned out that they were looking for another keyboard player and we just went on from there. <laughs> um, they flew me out to Chicago and we played and I actually, you know, part of what they wanted, uh, what if Frankie Sullivan, who you know wrote Eye of the Tiger, wrote all that great stuff with Jim Peter, um, he uh, wanted to at that time uh, make sure that who he was bringing in was a writer and not not just a player. So oh, I think that was attractive to them. Um, and all my years of you know obviously writing music uh, was I was right perfect for that. You know, it it, it was you know, a, a good fit in that respect. Yeah. But I, yeah, I, I, till this day, I never asked them how they got my name <laughs> because I thought it didn't look good. <laughs> so I said, screw it. But I, I often think about it. it you know, I, I, I'm playing in LA so often and, and everywhere else. I play all over the country with different bands that I'm in now. Um, they're not necessarily, you know, huge names or famous, but they, uh, they work a lot and yeah. I work a lot. So, um, or was before all this. Um, you know, and uh, it's very possible that they came across me through people I knew or or have known or or what you know. But I, unfortunately, I don't I don't really have a great story. The no, real you know story what? in twenty in twenty thirty years that could be a rad story when emails like to the wayside and they're like, yeah. dude, you got an email, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> instead of you know, instead of just uh, getting it from the cloud directly yes. into my brain, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is there? One thing that was pretty cool, you mentioned before, and I wanted to tie it in, but you said like you didn't know until later in life like what you liked about going on the stage. Do you still to this day get like, I'm guessing you mean like the rush from it, being on stage in yeah. front of people? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, there's, there's nervous energy, and that nervous energy can be 
utilized negatively or positively. Oh yeah. D- depending on how you how you uh, direct it, and so, and I, I'm not the only one that has that has said this, but I think it's pretty appropriate is that if you're not nervous when you get on stage, you probably shouldn't be getting on stage. Oh, totally, man. You know, there's there's a certain anxiety that you have to deal with, which isn't a bad thing if if you know how to harness it. Because it's that energy that puts you on a pin, you know, head of a pin that it get makes you very sharp. And um so yeah, uh, I I guess I'm a little bit of an you know a little bit of an adrenaline adrenaline junkie for performing i'm not a bungee jumper good you know i'm not gonna do handstands on a chopper (laughs) you know (laughs) that's just not me but getting on stage is my bungee jump i guess for me you know it's what i need to do and you know during this this lockdown period it's the first time in my life that a weekend had gone by that i'd didn't get on a stage. Yeah, that's true. That's wild. I mean, I never thought about it in those terms, but my life is living from stage to stage, from show to show, you know, come home, work on some music, rehearse, travel to a show. That's all I do. That's what I've been doing for 20 years. Yeah. I can't do it right now. And I'm freaking out. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what to do with myself. You yeah. know, it's, so it's, it's hard. Are you I, writing a lot? Did, were you able to, obviously we're three months in now. Were you, are you fa- finally able to get to, into a routine being yeah, home or is I, it still weird? I, 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 no, uh, not, not what, not what I want. You yeah. know, obviously, I mean, I, every day I, I keep thinking it's, you know, I'm going to wake up from this nightmare, but <laughs> I mean, it's not like, I mean, there are people that have it far worse. Than, oh yeah. We're not sick, fortunately. And, and, um, you know, we're, we're not, uh, we're not on the streets. So, I mean, I, I, I have to be careful. It, it, you know, it's a very serious problem that we have right now. And, and I'm fortunate that at least I have my studio and, and I can still create. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing the best to make lemons, lemonade out of lemons. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people, are. I think we're going to see a lot of really good stuff from talented people come out of this period. Uh, who knows what we'll see um, or how, but um, I've, I've, I play a lot, you know, I, I'm, I'm recording little videos I put up on, on my, my Facebook page and, oh, sweet. I, and I, I try to make it like a performance, you know, and then uh, I still have uh, other projects and bands that I'm working with. Uh, we're getting, we're actually starting to prepare to go back out. Oh yeah. What's interesting about this COVID situation is that big national acts that are usually being booked uh, the, in in conjunction with like Live Nation, yeah, yeah, and some of these big concert promoters, those concerts aren't coming back. Like Survivor, right now, we're done for the year. Yeah, you know, we we had a whole year booked. In fact, I was about to board a plane before I got a call in March that said we're gonna not, we're not doing this gig. I, uh. I didn't know I was gonna stay home. I just knew we were canceling the gig. Yeah, yeah. And so I turned around, came home, and didn't go back out for three months. And then, you know, talking to them, they're, they, they basically, uh, they're shut down. And a lot of the bigger acts are shut down. But some of the smaller acts, the ones that play casinos and some of the mid-sized rooms and some of the outdoor shows, they're going to come back a lot quicker just because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's probably less dangerous in their calculation. Yeah. Um, so I'm, pre- I'm preparing to go out with a couple of bands that I play with now that, that I'm looking forward to. That'd so that's cool. good. Yeah. What's your, great. you've played everywhere, I'm yeah. sure. Is there, is there like a favorite venue or city that you've played in? Um, well, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really partial to, to L.A., <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I'm it's sure. It's my hometown, and uh, I grew up, you know, at a time when a lot of really iconic places I got to be in. I got to play at Gazzari's, the Troubadour, you know, um, Club Lingerie, the Viper Room, which was used to be called the El Centro. Oh, wow. And and so, I mean, I, I, th- th- those were my homes, you know. And so I don't want to see them closing. I don't want to see them. I know the Troubadour's having trouble. 
Yeah, a lot there's of a, places there, there, There's a lot of real famous icon, iconic places that are in danger. Um, I think personally, to answer your question, though, uh, for me, I like the more intimate places. I mean, I've played, you know, in front of 30,000 people and you don't, you don't, it's not the same. I, it's more exciting to play for 500 people yeah. or a thousand people. It really is. Um, then, I mean, yeah, it's exciting when you're walking on stage and you see, you know, a throng of people, but that, that goes away real fast when you start to play because you really can't see beyond maybe 15, 20 yeah, rows. True, yeah. Beyond that, it just looks like water, a sea of heads, you know? <laughs> so you don't really connect with – the way you connect with that kind of an audience is different. You know, it's a more – it's an almost internal thing and you kind of project it everywhere. Whereas in an intimate, more intimate setting – you can you you can see smiles. You can yeah. see people singing. You you can kind of and and that that interaction is what I think most musicians crave anyway. So um, yeah, one of my you know I love the Roxy. Um, uh, there, there's a, a few small places that we played in Chicago that are really really nice that that we played. Um, uh, you probably wouldn't. They're not famous places, but just the smaller venue rooms yeah, that we did. That's cool. Um, yeah, so that's awesome. Do you remember the first time that you played like in front of a lot of people? Like you coming out in the crowd, just all those people? Yeah, but I was so young. My <laughs> first time my first time on stage was probably in front of five thousand people. Oh my god. So playing the hungry tiger to five <laughs> was odd, you know. Um <laughs> you know, it obviously it became normal because, you know, you're, yeah. you're, but, but yeah, I, I, um, I sang in front of a congregate. I, 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 <laughs> I was singing, uh, at my bar mitzvah. Okay. Uh, I wasn't a singer at the time, but the cantor, uh, his name is Nate Lamb and he's an interesting guy. You should look him up. Uh, L-A-M, Lamb. He, cantor Nate Lamb, was known as, and I didn't know this growing up. I, I mean, I knew this growing up, but I didn't know it at the time. That's what I meant. He was considered to be the sing, the the the, uh, the singing teacher to the stars. Oh my god! He had he had a side hustle at the temple, teaching major actors like John Travolta and people like that how to sing. Oh my god! I mean, it was it was um, Stephen S. Weiss. So it was kind of a, you know, uh, kind of a, a, had a very affluent congregation and a lot of Hollywood people went to this particular temple. So I sang, uh, I, I, I was, it was, I was 13. It was time to kind of learn how to sing these Torah scriptures. Uh, I'm not a religious person. I, I, none of that was interesting to me, but the music part of it was. Yeah. And so <laughs> so I got to sing. So I said, all right, whatever. So I, I learned this part and I got up. And during these kind of events, like a high holidays uh, ceremony, you know, it's a religious ceremony. It's not, you know, stand up and clap and do a standing ovation. Yeah. And I got one. <laughs> and I, th I guess the reason why is that I'm, I'm a pretty, in stature, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not real tall, you know? So and at 13, I was probably, you know, the size of like, you know, I was six inches. <laughs> I was a really small kid, but I had a voice that could project all the way to the back of the room. And I think that just floored people. And I could sing in tune, too. So it was even more powerful. So I've always been able to uh, harness that energy. And, and so my first experiences were always in front of a lot of people. So I, I, I've never, I don't know if you're asking me if it made me nervous to be in a lot, in front of a lot of people. It, no, being on stage does not make me nervous. No, it seems being like on, you loved it. Like right from the beginning, like you like thrived from it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Now I will tell you that getting on stage is harder than being on stage. If you know what I mean. Oh it's, yeah. 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 Especially I, I, I'm not ashamed to admit it, especially with survivor. Uh, there's a certain, when you're doing your own music, you know, you have uh, a loyalty to yourself and, and to the fans if they know the music. 
But when you're dealing with a legacy such as Survivor, a 35 year legacy that you, I feel like a steward of their material. I didn't write it. Uh, I'm not there. The people aren't there for Jeff as much as I'd like to believe they are. They are not. They're there to hear Eye of the Tiger. They're here, you know, high on you. They want to hear those songs. And so there's a little bit of, you know, am I going to let them down, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that little bit of nervousness is, can be uncomfortable. But once I'm on stage and I sit down, and what, what makes me at ease is touching this. Yeah. As soon as I touch this, it's like some kind of magical force, and I'm like, I'm good. Yeah. You know? Oh, man, dude, this has been so awesome, man. I'm having fun. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for taking time. One thing I like to ask people before I let them go is, obviously, you were doing music for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, was there anything else that you thought you could have done, like, before music, or was there any other passions that you had? Yeah, you got to remember, I discovered music at about 12 years old. I know, yeah. And I didn't decide to be a singer or a musician until – a whole two years later. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I was pretty young the whole time. So, um, but before that, I had a, I still do, I have a, a, an interest in science. I was always very science, science minded. I wasn't very good at math, but I, I like to theorize and conceptualize. Um, I was always interested in, I always thought I was probably going to end up some kind of theoretical science of some kind. Um, I used to read uh, a lot about you know, quantum mechanics and and stuff like that. So I was always interested in that. I don't know if that would have become a passion for me or not. Um, Astronomy was a big hobby of mine when I was really young. Uh, I had a telescope and I couldn't wait to, to, to just, you know, see what I could see and discover. So I've always been very, um, and and I've always been really electronically inclined too. I, I like to tinker with stuff and you know, like my Rhodes and my Wurlitzer, I, I, oh, I like to awesome. mess, ar- mess around with it. And, and so, I, yeah, I think I probably would have been somewhere in, in the science end of things. That's awesome. I always love asking people that, like, no matter what they do, act, direct, you know, behind the scenes, musician. And it's always cool to hear, especially when they found something so young. Sometimes it's like, I want to be a doctor. And they were like 10 years old. But then after that, dude, they just started acting. So yeah. like, that goes out the window. But uh Dude, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm so happy. That thank you for having me. That's me. But dude, your stories and just everything about you is so cool, man. Man, wasn't Jeffrey awesome? He was so cool. It's like a guy I can talk to for hours, especially just he does like that grueling job. You know, he's going from city to city. He's just rocking out. For him right now, he even said he this is like something he's never done before. He's never not worked. So make sure... I'm going to put his website in the episode notes or if you're watching this, you know, in the YouTube notes and you'll be able to check out his website, to see all the stuff that he's worked on. But do the behind the scenes on karate kid. You can't get that anywhere else. Well, I guess maybe if you're at a Ralph Macchio, like dinner party or Martin Cove, maybe, but not as cool as this because this isn't a main character. He's really, like when I talk to people that are smaller parts in some of these big movies, maybe later on they go on to do bigger things, their eyes are more wide open because they see it all. So yeah, so make sure you check out him out and don't forget to review, rate, share our podcast, follow us on all social media at sequels only, and don't forget to check out our website, sequelsonly.com. Good night.